two, one. Hey friends, welcome back to Bible Fun with the Duns. Today we read Song of Solomon chapter three. And I just want to share with y'all um, kind of what I've shared with my Sunday school class. We read through the Bible together uh, with our church family. And that is our curriculum each week, the Bible is. Um, and that's what we discuss every Sunday. And so I was talking to them and, and saying how this has been a game changer. Usually I read through Song of Solomon and I'm, I have big eyes and I give it the side eye and I'm shocked at some of the things that it says. But um, I'm digging in this time and I'm reading and studying um, in a few different ways than I normally would. So face value, this relationship between Solomon and the Shulamite. Um, in chapter three, what we see is uh, the bride has a dream that she is searching for Solomon. She's searching for the guy and she's looking and looking and she can't find him. And so she wakes up and she goes and searches for him in real life and, he, and she seeks him. And finally, uh, she does find him. And so in chapter three, we finally get to the wedding part of this. So they're dating. It's the courtship phase before this. And now it's the wedding phase. And so Solomon shows up on the scene in verse six. And um, it's all the pomp and circumstance of a king. They're carrying him in on this um it says the litter of Solomon, and my Bible tells me it's like a couch where servants would carry a king. And so they bring him in, and, and it describes what this looks like. And so at face value, we're setting up the wedding scene. And so in the next few chapters, we're going to continue on. And really, Song of Solomon is meant to be read all together. So if you have a moment, maybe take the time to just read through real quick. And then we can dissect it chapter by chapter. I probably should have said that the first chapter. But um, so we're getting a snippet of this. But as I read through, we take it at face value. But I'm also reading through um, the passion uh, paraphrase version of scripture. And this one, this version really digs into this idea of it being an allegory, a picture of our relationship with Christ, which um, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the writers of the Passion Translation. It says, the purpose of the Passion Translation is to reintroduce the passion and fire of the Bible to the English reader. It doesn't merely convey the literal meaning of words. It expresses God's passion for people and his word by translating the original life-changing message of God's word for modern readers. So it's important to know as I read through this, um, it's really an educated paraphrase. They, they do look to the original Greek and Hebrew text, uh, Hebrew text for Song of Solomon. And, um, they stay close to that, but there was a, a comment in this little excerpt of the beginning. And it says, The fear is that we over-spiritualize the Song of Songs, but how hard that would be. How wonderfully spiritual and holy is this song of all songs. So this is scripture. Of course it's spiritual. Of course it has depth and meaning beyond um, just this basic relationship between the Shulamite and Solomon. So there are takeaways that we can get from that face value relationship. Um, if we don't separate the chapters, we go from chapter 2 to chapter 3. And we just see the way that they talk about each other, the way they describe each other, the way that they are, again, that that Twitter pated, that Bambi uh, love feeling that they have for each other. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, especially early, in the early days of dating and getting to know each other when you find your love interest. Um, but when you're in a committed relationship and it is, it's way more than that Twitter pated, all the ushy gushy feelings, feelings come and go. Um, and so as you read through, maybe you're like, oh, I love the love that they have for each other. I love the way they champion each other. I love the way that they, um, 
speak so highly of one another. And I think culture around us and the world around us today tell us like, oh, you're supposed to, you know, joke about your husband. You're That relationship's supposed to be kind of a joke. Um, but we are not to be like the world. We are to be part of the upside upside down kingdom and this countercultural idea. And so what if even in our relationship with, with our spouse, what if we showed the world what loving the Lord looks like and what um, loving our spouse looks like because we love the Lord? What if um, we fought against this idea of, you know, the broken home and, and marriage as a, a thing of the past? What if we held our spouse in high regard the way that um, Solomon and the Shulamite give us examples? And so, in your marriage, in your relationships, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to grow that passion and that fire that you have for your spouse, to give you a heart that wants to um, speak so highly of your spouse, to grow your spouse in a way that they live in a way and they grow in Christ in a way where you want to speak highly of them. They have things to speak highly of and to champion each other and to put this into practice. And I think you would be amazed when you come to God with a desire like that, something that you know lines up with God's will for your marriage and for your relationship. I think it will um, surprise you that God answers that prayer and he's faithful to do that. The other side of this, as I read through the Passion Translation, I am my mind is blown by the things that I see. And talk about we don't separate um, the spiritual from this. This is not just about Solomon and the Shulamite. This is very much our relationship with God. And so Solomon in the Song of Songs would be an example of Christ. He would be a symbol of Christ. And then the Shulamite is us, the reader. Um, and so that's a symbol of that. As we start out the Passion Translation talks about the different things that are symbols in here. Lilies are symbols of our pure devotion to Christ in the temple of our inner being. Foxes are the compromises that are hidden deep in our hearts that keep the fruit of passionate devotion to Christ from growing within us. Hair is a symbol of our devotion to Christ. Pomegranates are equated to human passion and emotions. Um, and so, just an idea of what we see. And as I read through, I do see that. So, another thing to mention, Solomon, his name is mentioned seven times in the Song of Solomon, which is that that uh, number of completion, that number of perfection. And so, if he is a picture of Christ in this book, um, that's a neat thing that kind of lines up with that. Something that um, stands out to me as we read through it's closing out in chapter 2 and, and leading into chapter 3. Um, in verse 10, Solomon says, Arise, my love, beautiful one, and come away. So if Solomon's a, a symbol for Jesus, Christ is saying, Come away with me. Again, he says it in verse 13. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. But then, um, and he's saying, Catch the foxes for us in verse 15. Catch those foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. And so he's saying whatever may hinder our relationship, whether it be sin, whether it be idolatry, anything that can get in the way of our relationship, take care of those foxes. Let's get rid of those so that we can have the, our relationship to its fullest. And then it's hard to to notice, at least in my ESV version, but her response in 16 and 17, my beloved is mine and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. So what she's saying is not right now. He has said, come away with me. He said it a couple of times. Come away with me, even get rid of anything, get rid of the sin or anything that may keep us from being in relationship together. And then her response is, oh, it's not time right now. Turn away and just wait. And then we go straight into chapter three and it, it starts out with her saying on her bed at night. So um, she's saying she's 
she has this dream of seeking after him and she's looking and looking for him, but she can't find him. And um, the Passion Translation talks about how this is actually the result of her not responding to God, God telling her to act on something. He says, come away with me. He says, get rid of the foxes, get rid of the sin that um, are hindrances in our relationship. And the next thing you know, she is struggling and she is going through this time because not only is it possibly in her dream, um, but also she wakes up and she rises and she looks and looks for him and she can't find him. Well, the Bible tells us if we seek for God, if we look for him, we will find him. If you seek me, you will find me. If you search for me with all your heart is what the scripture tells us. And so what we see in this is she's not really looking to find him. She has disobeyed his call to, to come away with her, um, to come away with him and follow him. And she's not responded to his call to get rid of those foxes, to get rid of those things. And so what we see in the beginning of chapter three is this struggle. She is wrestling with this time in her life and she feels like she can't find God because she has chosen to do this without him. She says, turn away for now. Um, by the end of chapter two, turn away. She decides not to obey him. And so from chapter one until this point in chapter three, we see this beautiful love story, this pursuit that really happens in real life with the Holy Spirit pursuing us, God seeking after us in this love relationship. And a lot of us, we fall for him and we love him and we maybe go to church and we experience those um, emotional mountaintop moments of worship and stuff. But then this is relationship, just like in our marriage relationships, just like in our human relationships, those feelings do not sustain us. It is a commitment. It is a daily decision to take up our cross and to follow God every single day. And so in our relationship, yes, it's lots of that good mountaintop emotional moments of a joy and all the good feelings, but at the same time, walking and relating, being in a relationship with God, he's going to call us to be like him. He's going to call us to be holy. He's going to say, come follow me and leave behind sin. Leave behind, you fill in the blank. You know what your sly foxes are. You know what the things are in your life that are separating you from him. So as we read through this, we kind of see a picture of our own relationship with God. We walk with him. The pursuit is so fun. That is the best part of the relationship, any relationship. That is so fun, getting to know each other, falling for each other, falling in love with each other. But then when it calls for commitment, when it calls for choosing that relationship over and over and over again, choosing that relationship over other pretty things that might uh, grab our attention, that's when it calls for faithfulness. That's when it calls for commitment. That's when it calls for daily dying to ourselves. And I'm afraid, I can't help but think of the parable of the sower. I'm afraid too many of our relationships get stuck at this point. We like the fun part of relationship with God. We like maybe even the church scene. We like the small group scene. We like the worship scene. But when it calls for actually changing things in our life, actually making decisions that might change something that might go against um, our own will and our own way. I think a lot of us get stuck in this point when we decide to disobey him. And then we are in this where, where she finds herself in chapter three. We are in this place of um, trying to do life without him, trying to, to solve our own problems, try to go day by day without him. And it we feel lost. And that's what you see here. But that's not the end of the story. Thankfully, we're only in the early part of chapter three because she seeks him. And then she really starts looking for him. And, and so just like scripture says, you seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And then we get to verse six and it says, what is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke 
perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant. So this is Solomon. This is the king being carried, and he has this perfume. And remember, he is a symbol of Jesus. And so what we see here is a change in their relationship. She chooses him finally. She chooses to obey. She chooses to come away with him. And this is where the wedding starts. Um, and so what we see here, you see that myrrh and that frankincense, those are spices in this day that were used for sacred anointing oil. Uh, myrrh is used for the suffering and the death of Christ. That's what that is. Remember, the kings brought, Jeb's over here nodding, the kings brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Another, um, that was when Jesus was young, and they bring that to him, and it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in his life. And then frankincense is the fragrance of Christ's perfect life and ministry. So these are very symbolic of this relationship, this wedding between the Shulamite and Solomon. That is our salvation point. That's when the relationship really begins. The pursuit has been going on, but then that decision to obey and to follow God, this is when the wedding relationship begins. And we're going to continue reading about this wedding relationship between the Shulamite and Solomon, but also in our own relationship with God. I hope you stuck through. I know it was a lot, but my mind is being blown um, by this book of the Bible that I, I usually kind of just let my eyes fall on the words and rush through typically, but it's making me fall in love with the Lord more and more. And I hope that, um, you are reading it with fresh new eyes and the Holy Spirit is revealing, um, this beautiful love story to you also. Thank you, friends. Thanks for joining us. Uh, catch us tomorrow for chapter four. Bye.